Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so I also would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for organizing this really nice workshop. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and uh, so this talk is about something related to Red and TrueSet. And I somehow imagined that m most of the audience would not be too familiar with the topic. So um, it's more uh, like a historical overview and giving some intuitions about the subject than this result. There will also be in the end something about this result, but the, the beginning will be a bit slow. So if you know something about the topic, I apologize. It's maybe too slow, but I hope um, for most of the audience it will be fine. Um, but uh, the result that I will speak about at the end is joint work with six other people. And I could not resist but, of course, put some pictures. They're all from the university pages, so they're unfortunately not too embarrassing. Um, but you can see, so the, the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side here, these are people from Dortmund, and these are Connor and Hao Dong, who are also in this workshop, right? So if you want to know more about the topic, you can also ask either of them. And so uh, in the author, in the order of alphabetically by surname, this is Ardab Chatterjee, this is Amin Koya Oglan, you know Connor, this is Maurice Rolvin, uh, Pavel Zakharov, and Haudong. Yeah, so these are the people that uh, the work is joined with. And to motivate the whole study of random two set, um, and why I personally find this topic very interesting and also fulfilling, I want to zoom out by quite, quite a bit and start with a quote by Stephen Hawking, who famously said that I think the 21st century will be the century of um, complexity. And so um, this is provably a quite broad statement. And I think as far as I know, there is no agreed upon definition of complexity. But if you maybe take this as some kind of motivation, right? So in a globalized world with a lot of technical advances, somehow interdependencies in our everyday life become more important. Um, and there is a lot of, for example, data that's now available due to like technology and also uh, the evolution of uh, computers, right? So maybe we can agree upon the fact that there's a lot of complexity surrounding us. And as I said, there is no specific definition of complexity, but maybe one feature of a complex system that I would like to uh, take as the starting point of our considerations is how can you maybe tell that a system that you're looking at is behaving in some complex way? Well, if it displays some kind of behavior, that's not easy to explain. And typically, um, we have good control Typically, a complex system will have many components, and you can somehow control each of the components in a good way, like you have con control it, for example, you can measure. Um, but then somehow the macroscopic or collective behavior cannot be explained if you just look at the microscopic constituents. So that is some uh, mark of complexity that you could work with. Uh, and also in combinatorial probability, we know this kind of behavior. For example, if you look at many classical and very prominent examples in combinatorial probability, like uh, random graph coloring, the maximum independent set, we have already heard and heard about and worked on cut and bisection problems on random graphs, and also the topic of today, a random K set. So each of these is typically described by some graph structure or by some graphical representation. Um, where vertices are the single components, and they interact by randomly placed edges between them. And in some cases, like for example, um, KSAT, um, these interactions place a constraint, or let's take graph coloring, an edge would place the constraint that the vertices cannot take the same color. And so that would be the kind of interaction. And often in these systems, as we will also maybe see later, in trying to satisfy these kind of constraints at the same way, the system or the random graph organizes itself in a non-trivial way that's not easy to describe. And so that's um, how I would like you to view maybe the next uh, the discussion in the next few slides. Um, you can view it as a complex system and we are trying to look, find some explanation of the behavior that we observe. Okay. So um, the specific topic of this list that I would like to focus on is Boolean satisfiability. So first we will look at the deterministic setting, 
uh, and then move on to the random cases. So the Boolean satisfiability problem that you have likely heard about is you take a propositional formula. So you have variables and set of uh, logical relations. Then you ask yourself, can this formula be satisfied by setting the variables to Boolean values true and false? So does there exist an assignment such that the overall formula evaluates to true? And there are typically two kinds of basic questions that you can ask about such a formula. Uh, so the first one is, does there exist any satisfying assignment? And the second one related, or maybe as a next step, if there exists a satisfying assignment, how many of them are there, can I count them? So there, the type of question that you ask for the two is a bit different. Uh, so the first one is a decision problem. And if you look at uh, generally the problem for general form of formula, uh, then this is NP complete. So I'm not a computer scientist, so let me give you the hand wavy definition of NP complete. So this means that there is no polynomial time algorithm to decide this unless P is equal to NP. So, um, and this was actually to be the first problem to be shown to be like among the very hardest of these problems. Um, then the second one is not a decision problem, it's more like a counting problem. So you want to count the number of solutions. And this is um, proven to be sharp P complete, which is somehow the counting version of NP completeness. So also for this, there exists no polynomial time algorithm unless P is an equal to NP. Okay, so that's the basic uh, setup. This is very general, and to make some analysis, I would like to focus on a specific kind of formula in the following, namely formulas with some kind of structure that makes it a bit easier to de describe and handle. So uh, from on, now on, all our formulas um, will be in conjunctive normal form. What does that mean? So um, typically I like to write formulas as phi, and then we have two indices. So the first one describes the set of Boolean variables, x1 to xn. And the second one describes the number of so-called clauses. So we assume that the formula is the disjunction, um, the, sorry, the conjunction of uh, m disjunctions. Yeah, so um, you take the end of m clauses, and each clause is um, basically the or of k literals. Yeah, so this is the general formula, and this notion of literal is somehow important. I will just use this a lot during the talk. It only means either a variable or its negation. So that's, um, that's the terminology that I will use. Okay, and so for this restriction, you can ask the same two questions. So is it hard to decide um, whether there exists a satisfying assignment and um, if a satisfying assignment exists, can we count them? So um, maybe you know this, the answer to the first question. So for a given K, is this um, decision problem hard or is it doable in polynomial time? Okay, maybe every, two is, yeah, exactly, that's the point. Very good, yeah, so you already know this. Here there is a distinction. So you have to distinct whether, like, distinguish whether um, k is equal to two or k is at least three. Yeah, so deciding whether there is a solution is easy for two set. Uh, but maybe surprising, if you want to count solutions, this already becomes hard also for two set. Yeah, so the decision problem is somehow easy and the counting problem is hard. I'm focusing on two set because we will later go to two set. Okay, so that's uh, for the the deterministic version, one last comment, why is basically two set easy? Why can you decide whether there is a solution quickly? Um, maybe also someone knows already what kind of fact makes the problem easier, or not so much. Okay, so there is an easy like certificate to check whether a formula is satisfiable. Um, and this is called a bicycle, the structure that you have to look for. Um, so a bicycle basically means, you don't have to read all the definition, but um, suppose you think that your formula has a solution. Uh, you look at all the variables and you want to set a variable to true. 
um, then the bicycle basically means that the, the variable will appear in some clauses, two clauses, and if you set it to true, maybe there are some clauses where that are not fulfilled where negative x appears, so you have to set this to another value, the other, to the other variable to satisfy the formula, and so a bicycle is if you can reach by this implication chain the negation, so that you know you cannot set the variable to true, but then if you set the variable to false, you also reach the other, um, the original variable, so um, basically you cannot set it to any value. And it's known that, right, so um, CNF phi with clauses of length at most two is unsatisfiable exactly if you have this kind of bicycle and you can check for bicycles fast. So this is basically what makes two set easier than k set. Okay, so. Ah, okay. Um, no, it, I mean it's an easy way to check whether it's not satisfiable, whether it's not satisfiable, and if you have it, finding. Um, Yeah, so yeah, I guess. Right. Yeah, basically because you can just trace the implications. Yeah. Okay. Good. So this was all deterministic. What I want to do next is random case set. So motivate why we look at random formulas. Uh, so one motivation or one possible observation is that um, even though theoretically case set is hard. Often in practice, um, like what people call industrial set solvers, um, they can quite fast decide whether your formula is satisfiable or not. Uh, so most of the sub formulas that you meet in practice, they're somehow not hard. Um, but it was observed by, for example, Selman, Mitchell, and Levesque uh, that random instances of free set, if you generate them in some way randomly, which I will specify later, then they appear to be very difficult to solve if you put a certain relation of clauses to variables. Yeah, so this is quite difficult to solve. So the question that I find very interesting is also what kind of features make these random formulas harder than the deterministic ones that you see in practice. Um, and of course, this can also be used practically to improve your set solvers. Um, so up to date, I wanted to make this comment because we had the talk by David Gamarnik um, on the first day of the workshop. So there is no fully developed like um, theory or algorithmic complexity theory for this kind of optimization problem on a random structure. Uh, so there is not like some kind of like in the deterministic sense you say okay this, if this problem is hard then the other problem is also hard. Um, but there is for example this overlap gap property that can be used to explain some of the or the failure of some classes of algorithms. Okay and now we will turn to random two set. Um, this is, to specify this model, we just take n Boolean formulas and we choose, we fix also the number of clauses. Um, and for each clause, we just choose two variables uniformly at random. And then we choose their sign, so you have four possibilities. And for, uh, so each, um, for each clause, you have four times n choose two possible two, um, choices. And we do this independently for every clause, so you can have some double, but okay, never mind. So this is the probabilistic model. Um, and we will scale it in a specific way, such that the number of uh, clauses grows linearly in the number of variables. Um, so m, the number of clauses, will be asymptotically equivalent to d times n over two for some real parameter d. So this is some parametrization. You can imagine if D is small, you have very few clauses, it will be very likely to have a solution. If you increase it, it will be less and less likely. And the parameter is maybe a bit unusual, but so um, it's basically chosen such that you control the number of clauses in which each variable appears. Yeah, so you could also just take um, some constant times n, but here it's like just that you really control the number of occurrences of each variable. And this is, in fact, the right um, ratio of clauses to variables to observe some interesting behavior or some complexity. Namely, it's already been proven in the early 90s that there exists a sharp satisfiability 
um, threshold for this problem, which means that the model has a sharp transition from being satisfiable to being not satisfiable at um, a clause or at basically the point where each variable appears in two clauses. Yeah, so um, if you appear in 1.999 clauses on average, then with high probability there is this, exists a solution, and in 2.001 clauses, then there will be no solution with high probability. Uh, so that's uh, already settled for quite a long time. And um, this has also merited the attention of further studies. So now that you know that there is a satisfiability phase transition, uh, you can maybe zoom in into this critical window and determine the exact probability um, with which the formula is satisfiable in this region. So there is work by Bolobash, Box, Chase, Kim, and Wilson. Um, so they basically determined that um, the interesting behavior um, appears in a width of length n to the two-thirds clauses. Uh, so n plus n to the two-thirds clauses and n minus n to the two-thirds clauses, um, which you basically see here, right? If you multiply, you get n to the two-thirds. Yeah, and you see that there is a region where this is polynomial in this parameter lambda to the cube, and here it's exponential. So just to say that for TUSAT, this is relatively well understood. People have a great deal of control over this window. Uh, and yeah, this has also attracted um, the attention of um, probabilistic uh, combinatorialists. And there's also more recent work by Dovgal de Panafieu and Ravelo Manana. So they exact, obtain exact really expressions for the number, um, for uh, counting uh, the number of satisfiable TUSAT formulae. And they also have a like, numerical prediction on how the curve should look in the critical window. Um, but it's just a numerical prediction. And because um, the paper is based on generating function techniques, I didn't want to put the exact formulas. I, I find them kind of scary. I know there are some <laughs> experts on generating functions in the audience, but it was hard to extract the specific prediction. Okay, so this is for TUSAT. Um, I briefly want to go to KSAT for K at least three, um, because the story is quite different there. The model is completely the same, right? You just fix the number of clauses, and then for each clause, you choose your variables and the negation or non-negation. Um, and we again take the same parameterization. The number of clauses grows linearly in in uh, k, uh, in the n, sorry, in, in n, and it's such that every variable appears in d clauses on average. So the same kind of thing. And in the 1999, there was a result by Friedgut, which is very um, well cited uh, and famous for this model. So he proved that there exists a sharp threshold sequence for the model. And so he proved, to look at this, there exists a function that depends on n, such that, okay, and also this function is bounded by constants, it cannot be very wild, such that for every epsilon, if you're below this um, function value, then the formula will be satisfiable, and otherwise not, if you're above. So this almost sounds like you get a satisfiability threshold for three, four, and so on, but unfortunately, it's not known whether the sequence converges. So it could be oscillating, it could have some weird behavior. Um, and this is um, basically, of course, everybody believes that it converges, and numerical studies also suggest that it converges. Um, but, um, and this is known as the satisfiability threshold conjecture. So for K at least three, it's quite different. And I want to mention here that um, apart from, okay, does it converge, does it not converge? If it converges, what would be a plausible value of this, of this number? Maybe based on the two set, you have some conjecture what the value for general k is. <laughs> okay, exactly. <laughs> no, I was hoping for this, thank you. It's not like this, unfortunately, but. <laughs> yeah, okay, but um, some clever physicists actually put forward a conjecture on this value, and that is more, um, more elaborate. Um, so in the early 2000s, this attracted, or this question attracted the, the um, attention of uh, physicists. So Meza, Parisi, and Zekina, and in some follow-up work, Mertens, Meza, and Zekina, they put forward like an explicit characterization for this DK. 
that's based on the cavity method, which is some uh, version of the replica method from statistical physics that's a bit more algorithmic. Um, and I want to mention, so I'm not sure whether there are Italians in the audience, but I got like, <laughs> I did this mistake before, I will not do it again. So here, of course, you have to mention Giorgio Parisi, um, who got his uh, Nobel Prize in 2021 um, for his groundbreaking work on complex systems and also for the development of the replica method and the cavity method and other things um, that I probably know nothing about. But in this context here, um, it's notable that he was the one basically inventing this method or pushing it forward, and all of these predictions are based on. So um, that's non-trivial, and in particular, it's not really saying DK is 2.79 whatever. It's more like, okay, um, it's the solution to this kind of fixed point problem, and you can approximate it by this algorithm. So it's more conceptual than numerical. Uh, in 2015, famously, this conjecture was proven for a large K. So um, suppose that you have a random formula, then there exists a K0 such that for all K larger than K0, um, this value that we have seen before converges to DK, and this is really given by the physics prediction. So that's... Um, that was like a breakthrough in the field, but I want to uh, make the point um, that this only applies to large K, and by large K, I don't mean K is 50 or so, it's really one million or larger. And so this is, um, is of course, a breakthrough because um, something is proven about this, but it tells us nothing about three or four. And this is still open. Uh, this paper alone is, I think, 250 pages long. Um, so you can maybe see the complexity of this kind of result. Don't you think, don't you think like uh, yes, yes. So um, for for large k, it's now settled, and yeah, but the small k, yeah. Okay. Yes. So that's um, everything for satisfiability. Now I want to come a bit closer to the actual talk, topic of the talk, which is counting solutions. And so why would this be interesting? Just a brief met motivation. So if you have a solution, why would count it, be counting them be interesting? So again, you can also um, relate the number of solutions or the formula of the number of solutions to, um, to the algorithmic questions, for example. So suppose in two sets you have no clauses, and then your solution set will be a subset or will exactly be equal to the Hamming cube, to the 0, 1, to the n. So it's everybody, everything is a solution if you have no clauses. But then you add clauses and you cut out pieces of this Hamming cube and you somehow can observe how this set evolves in time, how it decomposes, whether you have a lot of connected components or not. Um, and you can imagine, for example, if you have two far apart connected solution components, if you start in one, or close to one component, it will be very hard to reach the other one and so on. With the, with an algorithm, okay. And currently, uh, there are very few t like theoretical tools available to actually count the number of solutions in this kind of problem. And the ones where it works, um, they are based on the methods of moments. I will say a bit more about this in the proof part if I come to this. Um, yeah, that's just the situation. Also, this is not so well understood. But for TUSAT, um, again, physicists Mona Monason and Zekina put forward um, a conjecture for the number of TUSAT formulas, uh, for the number of solutions to random TUSAT formulas, and also this is not, it's more conceptual, so I will not write it right now, but you will see in a second. But the type of statement is uh, the following, right? You have a function that depends on the average number of classes in which each um, variable appears that describes the leading exponential order of the number of solutions such that z is roughly like e to the n times phi this function. And um, this notion that I haven't introduced before, z of phi and the following will be the number of solutions of the formula. Okay, so this uh, is basically the, the kind of thing that you want to prove. And uh, in 2021, 
um, we basically proved this formula. So if you compare it to the previous statement, this expression here would be the function phi of d. Uh, so it's not super straightforward, but maybe also not too horrible. So um, let me maybe explain a bit more. So the setting is exactly as before, you take uh, the same parameterization, and then there exists a probability distribution that depends on d on the unit interval that's characterized as the fixed point of some stochastic recursion, um, such that if you sample from this distribution, these are all random variables from the same distribution, um, and you evaluate this functional at these random variables, uh, take expectation, then this describes um, the leading, uh, the growth order. So that's um, the kind of result that you would get with uh, following the physics heuristics. And there is also a nice um, like interpretation of this formula, but uh, this talk is not about this result. So I will not um, explain it right now, just to give you some flavor of the kind of result that you would get. Um, here you see um, this function phi like approximated. So um, it's basically from zero to two decreasing and here is the order of magnitude. Um, there is also, it's plotted against the basically first moment bound which is sharp in some other models. But here you can see that it deviates from the truth. Um, actually for every D you cannot see this here but uh, even more if you approach the satisfiability threshold. And the green curve we will see later. And there has been some previous work by Abe and Montanari, and Montanari and Shah, so basically they proved that this uh, quantity converges in probability um, for Lebesgue almost all D, um, and, but they didn't give the form of the, of the limit. Um, so. Um, make the relation maybe to the physics prediction. Um, and also there is a result where you relax the problem a bit um, by just estimating the number of assignments that are not exactly satisfying, but maybe don't violate too many clauses. Okay, so that's the result on counting the number of solutions. So we got some first order approximation. And the next step, or some kind of uh, law of large numbers, and of course if you're a probabilist, you would like to go for a central limit theorem type result next. So now having this result, the next question would be to study, or the next natural question I think would be to study the fluctuations around this limit. And also here I would like to give you some context for other problems in this kind of class, what is known for them. Um, so maybe the name doesn't um, sound too familiar, but if you look at random cakes or such, uh, which can be translated to solving linear equations over F2. Uh, you can also ask when is this system satisfiable and when not. So um, there you know that the number of satisfying assignments concentrates onto a single value with high probability up to the satisfiability threshold. So the probability that it's this and this goes to one, right? One value. Then if you look at other symmetric models like graph coloring, not all equal such, um, that have some kind of symmetry, there it's known that the, number of, the logarithm of the number of solutions actually super concentrates, which means that if you take log z and you, like subtract the expectation, this has bounded fluctuations. Right, so no normalization needed, it's just bounded. Um, so in Q-coloring, for example, if you take the logarithm of the number of Q-colorings, subtract the expectation, this has um, converges in distribution. So the limit is maybe not too, um, it's like basically some functional of Poisson, random functions of Poisson random variables um, that come from small subgraph conditioning. So I didn't put the specific limit here, but you can describe it in some sense. Um, yes, and this is not known up to the satisfiability threshold, but up to something that's called the condensation threshold. Um, so there are different other phase transitions before satisfiability, um, but I mean, typically the condensation threshold is very close to satisfiability. So almost up to satisfiability. There are also, the super concentration also occurs in a random case set if you 
if you really say every variable appears uh, in the same number of plus clauses and minus clauses, um, and also in the symmetric perceptron. So all these models that I've been showing, they, they really tightly concentrate. So they all have this kind of super concentration property. And that's basically everything that's, that's known about this kind of model. So um, maybe thinking ahead, what would we expect in random two set? Maybe um, if you are a bit, uh, maybe not too, too close to the field, you would also expect super concentration. Um, but here the situation is quite different. Uh, so um, this is the result that I would like to talk about. And um, I, I think really if you maybe uh, just follow part of the talk, the main thing is that this doesn't super concentrate. So if you take the logarithm of the number of solutions, maybe don't read the rest yet, but if you take the logarithm of the number of solutions and basically subtract the expectation, then you have to normalize by root m, which is basically of order root n, to show convergence in distribution to a normal limit. And so in all other models, you get the same, I mean, apart from the specific distribution, but without dividing by root m. So that's conceptually or phenomenologically new, right? So, um, and this is why I find this result quite interesting. This is some new kind of, I mean, or unproven kind of phenomenon in this kind of model. Okay, so why do we condition on z of phi being greater than zero, even though we are in the satisfiable regime? Uh, this is because um, the, every formula still has a small but non-zero probability of being non-satisfiable, and otherwise this expectation would just blow up. Um, so that's necessary. And um, the rest is basically here to characterize the variance of your normal distribution. Again, it's a bit similar, right? You solve some stochastic fixed point equation, uh, and then you plug it into some kind of functional, and this will be your um, limiting expression for the variance. I think maybe the proof. Can I ask a yeah. question about conditioning and concentration? Not too much about conditioning. Is, uh, so, should we expect somehow, because the problem in some sense is simple, right? So, you, there's more freedom to find solutions. So, should it be the, I mean, is it intuitive somehow that the number of solutions should fluctuate more? Or, I don't know, is there a connection between these two things? Um, is there something that can be explained in proof somehow? Yeah, so I mean, what I think is the main reason is that um, um, lit 2 sat and k sat in general is very prone to fluctuations in the, in the literal sequence. So it's somehow m m way more likely um, if you are a variable and you appear in 10 plus clauses and three minus clauses, then it's much better for you to be plus. Um, and so this fluctuation of the literal somehow um, steers the behavior of the number of solutions. Whereas in these symmetric problems, if you are, if there is a solution where you are plus, there's always a solution where you're minus, and this somehow um, leads to better concentration. So it's uh, more the influence of this, oh, of this, um, yeah, of the literals. Other questions? Okay, then um, here now I, I can explain the green curve. So this is um, basically a plot or an approximation of the variance. So the nice thing about these physics-inspired um, predictions is that you can typically approximate the value nicely. So, and this is oops, what, um, what we did here. So you see that it grows as you approach the d being equal to two. Okay, and just a small um, side part, what's the variance actually? Um, maybe if you're interested, so how do you actually define this variance? What's the operator that you have to look for a solution for? So um, if you take all probability measures on R2, um, then you can define an operator from that maps uh, such a measure to another measure. Um, if you take a bunch of copies of this measure, like so these are all samples from row, all independent. Uh, you take some Poisson random variables and some random signs, 
then um, the image of your probability distribution would be the distribution of this kind of vector. Yeah? So this is the first component, and this is the second component. And these are all, these size are all independent samples from rho, and you have to plug them into some kind of functional. Yeah. And we show that in a certain subspace, there exists a fixed point of this operator, and if you plug this fixed point into this functional and integrate it, you get the variance. Yeah. So this is the functional B that you have to integrate in the, in the formula for eta. Okay, but I think maybe the, I just wanted to show how it generally looks like. At this point, I think maybe the formula doesn't make so much sense. But uh, maybe if we um, look at the proof uh, technique, just a visualization of this fixed point. So it basically describes the um, correlation between uh, two um, different formulas. Uh, but I think uh, I will say I will come back to this picture. I think it makes more sense once uh, we had a look at the proof. Uh, are there questions about the results so far? Okay. Um, so I briefly two slides about how you would generally approach this problem uh, if you were in a symmetric model. So um, basically, you would compute moments, the first and the second. And if you can show that the second moment is of the order of the first moment squared, um, then you can often combine this approach together with small subgraph conditioning to get the precise limiting distribution of the number of solutions. So basically, this says once you, you study the influence of uh, small or short cycles in your formula on the number of solutions, and uh, given this, basically, you can evaluate um, the fluctuation. So basically, the rest of the variance that you cannot, exp because if this doesn't go to like one, right, then uh, you can explain the rest of the variance by looking at short cycles. So that's how you would do it, but this is only feasible if um, log z actually super concentrates about log of expectation of z, not, not expectation of log z, but log of expectation of z, and this is not the case in random two set as we have seen on this plot that I've shown quite a bit, because uh, this was the first moment bound, the black dashed line that I've been showing, and this is the actual value. So um, actually, the expected number of solutions is way higher than the typical number of solutions. So this approach cannot work. Yeah, you see this right from the previous result on counting the number of solutions. So what we do instead is uh, quite nice, and I really like this uh, idea. So, uh, and it's also easy. So if you don't, um, didn't follow maybe the last uh, part, uh, this is now the point to re-enter. So um, suppose you focus first on an easier task, not computing the limiting distribution, but just evaluating the variance. Then there is this basic formula that we all know, um, so the expectation of the first moment, of the second moment, I mean the second moment minus the first moment squared. And now you can just um, rewrite this by taking two independent copies of phi here. Right, this is the same value. Um, and here I have to say, um, maybe don't worry too much about this, but just to be a bit cleaner, um, to evaluate all of this, you have to assume that phi is satisfiable because otherwise, again, you will have like minus infinity. Okay, and now we borrow some idea from spin glass theory to set up like a family of correlated random formulas to evaluate this variance. So how does it work? Um, for every clause density, maybe here's the point to draw a picture. Um, you just construct two formulas on the same kind of um, variable set. And then you determine some number of clauses, M, such that they will have exactly the same clauses here. So they will be the same. And here you do something independently. Um, so this is what this says. So you fix this M and M prime and you just construct two formulas at the same time, such that um, the first m clauses are the same and the last ones are independent. So they share the first m clauses. 
So this is, instead of looking at one formula, we now have two formulas and they're coupled in this, in this way. Um, so if you particularly look at, for example, if the large M is small m, then the line is here and they are the same. On the other hand, if it's zero, then the line is here and they're independent. So you interpolate between being identically and being identical and being independent. Um, and so with this idea, you can somehow write this difference as a telescoping sum by swapping one joint clause through an independent clause at each step. Um, okay, why is this nice? Because um, each summand is somehow only a local change of a given formula. And this is way easier to handle. Just by comparing, like, um, you can just um, analyze this swapping operation way easier than analyzing uh, the original problem. And so that's maybe the main idea, setting up this pair of correlated formulas. And then using the telescoping sum. Uh, the problem now here is that, of course, we cannot take an expectation because the formulas are not satisfiable, as I was uh, assuming all the time. So you first have to do some kind of um, operation to make them, turn them into a satisfiable formula. And uh, we will, or we, we do, did this by using the unit clause propagation algorithm. Um, I maybe briefly say something about this or maybe not. <laughs> I mean, if you're interested, I can explain at the end of the talk, but I think it's maybe the variance decomposition is really the, the main thing. Okay, but the point is you get this kind of formula that's satisfiable and log z of phi hat doesn't differ too much by, from the original thing. So it's a good approximation if you um, do this construction. So now we have expressed the variance as a sum of local changes, and we need to evaluate all these local changes. And I will not go into the detail of what is happening next, because I think really the variance decomposition is the main part. But just to give some idea what the necessary steps are and that there is more work involved, unfortunately. Um, so you basically analyze these changes by looking at the local limit of this pair of correlated formulas which is uh, some form of Galton-Watson tree, or multi-type Galton-Watson tree. So if you pick a variable here, and you look at which clauses it appears in here and here, and you trace this, this will give rise to a tree structure, and this is nicely described as a Galton-Watson tree. Uh, then you establish that in this tree, you basically have a good decorrelation properties, which is formalized as Gibbs uniqueness. And then you analyze basically the root marginal in the tree by studying the belief propagation algorithm, which is a sparse version of approximate message passing, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is uh, the multi-type Galton-Watson tree that I wanted to show briefly. So here you have a variable. It appears in a bunch of joint clauses, which are red. And it appears in a bunch of separated clauses, which are blue for the first formula and green for the other formula. And then you add also the signs to the edges. So does this variable appear negated or not in the, form, in the clause? And so this is how, basically how the local limit would look like. Okay, so, and then you can evaluate the variance. Great. <laughs> so we have the variance, but still we don't have the exact distribution. Uh, but the good news is that uh, the rest can be basically done mildly automatically by using some central limit, theor central limit theorem from martingale theory. Uh, so we just need a martingale, and uh, what we do is quite generic here in the setting. So we define the clause exposure martingale. Uh, so the martingale that you would look at is basically look at the expected number of solutions of the satisfiable formula if you know um, the first M clauses, right? So you reveal one clause after the other and see how your expectation of the number of uh, solutions would change. So this is quite standard. Um, and if you look at the Martingale differences, there are certain criteria um, that you can check. Um, 
as such that you will get a central limit theorem. So this is an intermediate step, but here is the general theorem that is also the last part of the proof that I want to show. So um, this is from the book by Hall and Hyde, Martingale Limit Theory and its Application. Uh, so this is quite, quite nice. If you want to know anything about martingales, you probably can find it there. Um, and so it basically tells you three conditions to check on the increments such that you conclude uh, that your martingale array or martingale converges in distribution to a normal random variable. And basically the thing is these increments, they're quite similar to the increments that we had in the variance decomposition. So again here you have uh, the same kind of machinery applies. So if you can control this, you can also evaluate this. Okay, so this is basically the end and I would like to conclude with some short um, summary, what I think are maybe the main parts, points of the talk. If you haven't seen this before, so the satisfiability threshold in random two set appears uh, at the point where each variable occurs in two clauses on average. Then um, the expected value uh, of the logarithm of the number of solutions also in random two set um, divided by n uh, converges actually to a constant that matches also the physics predictions. Um, then maybe the main point, so this quantity does not super concentrate. Uh, this is the first result of this kind for random constraint satisfaction problems. And the proof maybe uh, goes via this analysis of um, pairs of correlated formulas. Okay, so um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>